everybody. Welcome to Take Off with John Clark, presented by Rivers Casino. And we're normally interviewing Philadelphia athletes, Philadelphia coaches, but we're going to the extreme now. And this is pretty cool. I'm sitting next to a man who will be a Hall of Famer, a WWE Hall of Famer when WrestleMania takes over Philly. Paul Heyman. Sir. It is good to see you again. Uh, my pleasure, I assure you. Good to see you. So what does that feel like to actually hear those words, Hall of Famer? Uh, old. Uh, yeah, I've, I've avoided it for a long time. It, it's, uh, I was offered it a couple times in, uh, so far in the past, and I just didn't want to do it while I, I was still active and still relevant and, and still uh, putting together a body of work of accomplishments. Um, because I always felt that like the Hall of Fame is a lifetime achievement award, and you know, thank you, goodbye. Uh, but it, it's WrestleMania 40. It's in Philadelphia, which is the birthplace of ECW. Um, it's 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 an acknowledgement, all puns intended, of of a body of work that is not yet complete. But just it, it, it's a perfect storm, and um, it, I think it would be disrespectful to what we accomplished in Philadelphia, what we started in Philadelphia, what was born out of Philadelphia, if, if I didn't accept it in Philadelphia. And it's, it's fitting, and you turned down the Hall of Fame a couple times. Did you finally say this is the right moment because it's in Philly and part of that? Yeah, well, I, th that's why, because it's, it's in Philly, it's WrestleMania 40, plus it's Paul Levesque's first year of, of choosing the Hall of Fame class, and, and it, to come to me and say, I want you to be the first person that uh, I, I, I name as a Hall of Famer and, 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 and headlining the first class, it would be disrespectful to Paul Levesque if I, if I turned that down. And I have great respect for Paul and what he has been doing as the head of creative uh, since he took that over. So uh, not wanting to disrespect Paul, wanting to respect Paul, and it's in Philadelphia, and it's WrestleMania 40. It's, it's all, all, all the stars are aligned for this. You started out, I believe, as a 13-year-old kid trying to break into the wrestling business. Now that you're going into the Hall of Fame and you've been in this business forever, what would you tell that 13-year-old kid that was trying to knock on some doors or bang down some doors in this business? Oh, I'd tell that 13-year-old kid, don't listen to the old man right now and just do, do, do what comes naturally to you, which is uh, be uninhibited in your approach of your ambition of pursuing your dreams. Uh, ex experience is the greatest inhibitor of creativity. Because when, when, you, when you first approach creativity uh, and, and you have absolutely no experience, you're completely uninhibited. N nothing sounds wrong to you. You're, you're willing to make mistakes. You're willing to fail. Uh, and, and, and as you get experience and as you get older, you don't want to fail. And you're trying to protect your reputation. And, and, and what you learn is what not to do. So uh, I, a 58-year-old Paul Heyman talking to a 13-year-old Paul Heyman would say, don't listen to the 58-year-old Paul Heyman. <laughs> and it's pretty wild because I first met you 30 years ago. I was in high school and I was a kid trying to be entrepreneurial. I wasn't good at school, so I started to get involved with professional wrestling, and I worked for you a little bit yes. and did interviews with you. You looked out for us, yes. and, and you maybe saw that that kid was a little like you when you were 13, yes. and people helped you out. Yes. Why was that so important to you? Because uh, when you're not good in school, but, but you can outsmart everyone in your class, including your teachers, uh, but you're just not wired for that sort of structure, um, creative people are, are, are never going to flourish in, uh, in boundaries and parameters. They, they need to expand. They, 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 they they need to find new ground. They need to find th uh, things that have, have, have not been done before. That, that's why they're wired to be creative. Um, and, and that was certainly me. I, I was terrible in school, but I could outsmart everybody in, in my class. Um, and and, and, and I, I could learn the subject matter like that and not have to sit through the, re the rest of, 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 of the dissertation from the teachers. So, um, you know, it, it, it's like I, it's like I, I ran away with the circus, you know, I, 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 I had all these uh, 
very, very interesting, eccentric people. Um, Captain Lou Albano, Freddie Blassie, the Grand Wizard, Afa and Sika, uh, Vincent James McMahon, Vince Sr., Arnold Skolan, Gorilla Monsoon. And, 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 and these guys took a liking to this ambitious kid that was coming in, that, that was trying to find a way to learn the business from behind the scenes. Um, Dusty Rhodes, who let me sit in production meetings even though I had absolutely no right to be there. So um, I would not have learned the business at such a young age if these people didn't look after me and, 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 and say, kid, it's okay. If you're that passionate about it, we're going to let you into the secret society. So when it came time for me to be the gatekeeper, I was going to open those gates to kids that I could see were entrepreneurial and, and assertive and, 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 and took the initiative to pursue their dreams and weren't going to fit in uh, by, by society's boundaries and parameters that were preset and, and uh, constricting to someone who was so entrepreneurial and so creative, such as yourself. And you're a great story because any kid out there that maybe doesn't fit in a certain part of life like school and stuff like that, they have a passion and they have a love. And you found your passion. You've been excelling at it all your life. And what is the proudest moment, would you say, at this moment when you're going to go into the Hall of Fame about your entire career and where you came from as that little kid trying to get into this business? I don't know if I've experienced it yet. Uh, I, 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 think, I think the whole pursuit of living, living one's dreams is, is, is never to be satisfied by them. That, that the moment that you live out a dream, you need to pursue the next one. Okay, I've lived this one. What's my next dream? Oh, I've lived this dream. What's the next one? When, when you run out of dreams, that's when you go and play Mahjong and Shuffleboard in Boca Raton. Um, and I'm not, just not ready for that. So um, I don't know if I've lived my proudest moment yet. And, and, and I, I, I really never take the time to look back and reflect because if you, if you sit there and, and you're looking behind you, someone's going to just whiz right past you because they're younger and hungrier and more ambitious and want to live the life that you're living. So I, 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 sharks swim forward. They, 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 they don't turn, they, they pivot, but they, they, they always are moving forward. They don't go back. So if you're a shark in the water, you just keep on going forward. I, I don't have time to sit back and reflect upon accomplishments because then someone's going to accomplish more. Well, it's an incredible accomplishment what you did in Philly with ECW 30 years ago, transforming the wrestling business. And I remember those days when I would see you, you'd tape a show at Cabrini College or ECW Arena in Philly. And I think it was a Thursday or a Friday night. And you had to get that show out on Sports Channel in Philly, I think by Monday night. Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesday at six o'clock. I don't know if you slept. No. Did you sleep? No. It was just a maniacal obsession to be the best and to put the best product out there? Well, I don't know if any creative pursuit is anything but maniacal. Because if you look at it from any sort of reasonable perspective, it doesn't make sense at all. But right. that's why creative people are creative, because they pursue their passions with, with such a zeal that anybody who's sane would sit there and say, what are you doing? Uh, and, 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 and the answer will always be pursuing my dreams. Uh, and pursuing one's dreams means that you're dreaming something that everyone else finds to be impossible, not feasible, unfathomable. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think it was maniacal um, and it would never have lasted if, if, if it was anything but. Yeah. Are, are you getting some sleep these days? Because, I mean, that was mo probably the most ambitious part of your career, right? ECW, starting an entire organization? It's certainly the most demanding, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a little more sleep now than in my 20s, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty wild. Um, and, and when you look at this Hall of Fame career, um, when you were dreaming as a kid, a 13-year-old kid, trying to bang down those doors, did you envision all of this? Or has this surpassed your wildest dreams about what you thought you could accomplish in the wrestling business? Well, again, it's, it's, it's once you accomplish one dream, then what's the next dream? Um, I, I, 
Am I where I dreamt about that I'd be when I was in my 20s? I didn't dream I'd live this long when I was in my 20s. So uh, every day above ground is, is, is a blessed day. Um, I, 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 I can't say that this was the specific vision, but I can't say that it wasn't either. I, I never really had an end game in mind. It, it, was, it was literally just, this is the rush, this is the thrill, this is the high. Um, I'm going to take the, I'm going to, I'm going to take the sports car around the turn at 140 miles an hour, even though you're not supposed to go past 40. Yeah. Um, and I'm just going to I'm just going to hold on for dear life with both feet on the gas pedal, and see where I end up. It's very rare in all forms of sports entertainment for someone to have the staying power that you have. Why do you think? you have been able to be at the top of your game for this long? Because every time I get canceled, I, I reinvent myself and come back and do something different. Uh, I, I, I got canceled as a manager. I became a color commentator. I became a color commentator and I got canceled as a color commentator. I be became a manager. I got canceled again as a manager and I came back as, 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 as the head of creative. I got canceled as the head of creative in my own company. And I, I come to WWE and I, I go back to being color commentator. And then I become, a, I become an advocate. And from the advocate, I become the wise man. And um, it, it's just a matter of uh, every run has an expiration date stamped on the back of your neck, which means you can never see when that, when that time is. Um, but um, society and, and pop culture and culture itself is going to move forward. So uh, what, what, whatever that dictates uh, is, is something that you have to play to. And, and you know, and, and you have to keep within just the core of, 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 of what makes it work. You know, to me, that's always under promising and over delivering. And, and, and that's in a business filled with hype. But still, you know, to just to, to over deliver to the audience, to always keep them guessing, to, to keep a level of mystique. And then when when you burn that out, come back as something new. It's, it's like an actor playing a different role uh, or on a different medium. You know, if, if, if you wear yourself out on Broadway, then you go into television. When you wear yourself out on television, uh, then you go to movies. When you wear yourself out on movies, the next thing you know, you're doing Shakespeare in the Park. But, but you keep active and, and, and you keep on finding, okay, here's a role that's not filled or here's a role I can create for myself and then and going to pursue it. it. It's not what you want. It's what the market dictates and then going after that. And it's interesting because you've always been so good at understanding where everything is going. So when I was growing up, you had your baby faces and you had your heels. Good guy versus bad guy. Everybody loved the good guy. Where along the way did you sense that kind of change with our society and how culture was changing where almost the heel, the bad guy, right. became the good guy? Well, that was during the very early stages of ECW in, in which, again, it, being born out of Philadelphia, where, you know, the baddest villains in the NHL were the Broad Street bullies. But in Philadelphia, they were gods. Yeah. They were, they, 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 I mean, parades every day for these guys. Kate Smith coming in to, you know, to, to open up the show with, with God Bless America? Yeah. Okay, with, 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 I can never get it straight. With God Bless America, America the Beautiful. With God Bless America, you know, it just, they, they became the, the, the local pop icons. And, and outside of Philadelphia, booed beyond description. <laughs> But in Philly, like, like now here in New York, we have this six, seven rookie playing for the Rangers. Uh, is, what, Remke? Yeah. Is that the guy's name? Matt, Matt Remke? And he had a black guy after his first game. He's right. fighting everybody. Right. First five games, he had four fights. <laughs> you know, and in one of them, he got oh, against Philadelphia. Yes. He got, get, yeah. Right? He got pulled down. He got he got pulled down uh, to the ice because yeah. he, okay, because the veteran knew this dude's six, seven, <laughs> and he's 21 years old. And it was a fight of the year. And it was a fight of yeah. the year. Now, take Remke out of New York. And this guy's the biggest villain in the NHL of it so far this yeah. year. You bring him into Madison Square Garden, and this guy's getting a standing ovation the moment he comes out on the ice. So if, if you take a look at that, and again, understanding what the Philadelphia market was going to be coming out of the era of the Broad Street Bullies, I realized that the lines between the, the heels and the baby faces, the heroes and the villains, the protagonists and the antagonists had been blurred so much that... You know, e e e even the villains had redeeming qualities and even the heroes 
had something where you went, wow, he's, he's somewhat compromised. And that also made for more intriguing characters because it had become some, so one-dimensional in pro wrestling slash sports entertainment that it, was, it, beca it became cartoonish. You know, the, I'm going to rip off your head and piss down your neck. Right. Or once I save the orphans from the, from the, burning, from the burning building, <laughs> I'm going to come to the arena, kiss babies, and sign autographs. Nobody's that that you know really yeah. pure, and 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 nobody's that has that much of a dark heart, yeah. you know, and, or 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 would be compelling if they did. So if if you if you gave some substance to the villains and why they became villains, and if you put some the, the, the heroes in a compromising situation, these became far more compelling and riveting characters. And I think Philly is going to be thrilled to hear that the Broad Street Bullies were kind of an inspiration for ECW. So was ECW, the way you build it up, was Philly the only place or the perfect place? The only place. They, 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 it was, it was, Philly was a very unique sports town. And ECW could not have been born out of even New York or, you know, Boston's a completely different culture than New York or, or, or Philadelphia. It couldn't have been born out of Boston. It had to happen out of Philadelphia. And the Broad Street Bullies were the template for what ECW was to become. And when you were with WCW originally as Paulie Dangerously as a manager and you'd come to Philly, did you notice the difference in the passion of the sports everyone fans did, everyone did. in Philly? Everyone did. Yeah. I mean, listen, they're very passionate sports fans in Boston. I mean, they're, they're, they're out of their mind. Oh, and, and, and what's, what's the college football uh, the college football team that comes out to uh, uh, jump around by House of Pain? Oh, you know, is it down is, south? Is, is, it's is, not that, Clemson. is that Nebraska? You know, wherever it is, you know, I, I, like, yeah. that, that, that's insane. Yeah. And, and that's that culture. But Philly, Philly had a culture that played to the dynamic of these are the villains and these and these are the heroes. And yet you're going to you're going to see how the script flips on both of them as the story gets told. And it was so unique for Philadelphia is just. The, the perspective that the sports community had in Philly was perfect for a product that in 93, 94 was looking to tap into what would then become known as extreme. Yeah, and, and you took it to the extreme, and, and the athletes and everybody in Philly will talk about how the Philadelphia sports fan wants authenticity, and they'll keep you honest. Did you feel that? Like, you can't fool the Philadelphia no. sports fan. No, no, no. If, if, if you lie to the Philadelphia sports fan, you're dead, on, you're dead in the water. Com completely. So they, they, they do demand authenticity. They, they demand that you're genuine with them. Uh, you can do anything else you want in life, but as long as you're genuine and authentic with them, if you're honest with them, if you give them uh, the, the honest portrayal of the product, they will reward you tenfold. But if you lie to them this much, you're finished. So, so starting ECW in Philly and building it to what you build it to, and then you see the business changing because of what you had found with w ECW. Uh, what did you take from ECW and Philly that you've used for the rest of your time? Just reading the room and, and, uh, and understanding what the audience wants, what they crave, what they yearn for, what they demand. Um, it's it, 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 you, you have to feel the pulse and, and and you have to be three steps ahead of the curve and have them follow you along if if if, if you get too far ahead of the curve and and they're not following you it's all for naught if you're behind the curve then they don't respect you so you you always have to stay right ahead but close enough for them to come along with you does it does it feel? really special when you arrive in Philly and WrestleMania is going to take place in the spot where you found ECW and started it and going into the Hall of Fame, all of these things wrapped together. It's, it's, it's a pretty great circle of life kind of thing. Well, again, I, I'm not looking for closure. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm you know, th th this is uh, like, you know, as I, I think I said it previous interview to me it's like accepting the rookie of the year award i'm just kind of figuring this out now and everything i've done along the way has just been you know just 
rehearsal for what we're going to do moving forward. Um, I've, I've always looked at every performance as merely an, obi- an audition to be invited back the next day. And, and, and I, I never rest on my laurels. So uh, every time I pull into Philadelphia, it, it, it's, it's, it's an emotional experience. There's an energy in Philadelphia. I used to, I, you know, when, when, I, when I was in New York City as a teenager and, and I got a job at Studio 54 as a photographer and as a publicist and as a promoter and as a producer, it was because I was, I was addicted to the energy of New York City. And there is, a, there is a sports energy in Philadelphia that just cannot be matched anywhere else. And every time I pull into Philly, you just you feel that atmosphere and uh, it, it, it's a fix. It, it's a high. It, it, it's a... Uh, it, it, I, I have a lust for it that, that, that can never be satiated. Hey, celebrity cook Steve Martirano is bringing his Italian-American cooking back home to Philly, where it started. Enjoy Martirano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's famous meatballs with Sunday gravy, prime steaks, and more. So make reservations for Martirano's Prime on Open Table. I've been to the one in Fort Lauderdale. I'm glad it's back in Philly. And, and that leads me to an interesting question because you have talked about what you do for others and they have talked about it. Pat McAfee talked about how you really helped him with his, his promo right. and things like that. What do you get the most fulfillment from these days? Is it, is it the on-camera performer feeling it from the crowd or is it you're kind of given an angle or given some promo words or whatever for another performer and you see him being lifted up by that. What gives you the biggest fulfillment? All, all of the above. I, I love everything that I do in this business. I, I, I'm, I, I'm afforded the opportunity to do things that I love because if, if I don't love it, I really suck at it. Um, so I, 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 I think there came a time in the business where, where, where the, the, those who make the ultimate decisions sat there and said, well, if we just give him stuff that he loves to do, he'll 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 produce for us. He'll 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 generate revenue for us. And if we kind of box him into that corner, it's he's a, he's a money drain. So um, I I love writing for and directing and producing other talent. The McAfee thing was interesting because um, they put McAfee in, in in a situation and they had someone who had written some stuff for him, but but didn't explain the context of it. So McAfee was trying to put this together in his own words, but nobody explained the context to him. And I could see him struggling with, with it. And I, I'm a big fan of Pat McAfee. So, um, so I just walked up to him and I said, and I kind of gave him the context within the, his own character of, 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 the, of the promo. And he understood it just like that and, and nailed it. Um, and, and, and that's a thrill for me. But it's also, it's also a thrill to go out there with Roman Reigns. And the bloodline, and 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 do our shtick because it's at an elite level that that few have ever tasted that rarefied air, uh, and to work with Roman Reigns is just such a, an enormous thrill, and it's just such an honor. Um, and, and a blessing to work with Roman Reigns. So when I'm out there with Roman Reigns and we're feeding off each other's vibe and, 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 and uh, the ability to go impromptu if something happens in the audience or the audience says something that we can then uh, sink our teeth into, um, that, that's a rush as well. So it, it's everything that I do. You know, it, it, it's, I, I can't narrow it down to one over the other. It's like saying, which one of your children do you love more? <laughs> I love them all, you know, right. and it's, so it's and, and 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 these aspects of my job are like my children. So so when you see how you have helped Steve Austin become wow, Stone Cold Steve Austin, and 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 then Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns, um, how much gratification do you get from that? Seeing them get to that next level, and by the way, how do you identify? who has it like how do you see that beforehand and say i think this guy can be at another level uh it, it, it is an intangible that, that I, I i don't have the words to convey it, it, it someone walks in the room and you go hey how you doing and you can look away from them and go back to the interview well then they, they don't have it but if someone walks in oh my god and you go hey hey interview over here yeah and you just can't take your eyes off that person. You're drawn to them. Their, their charisma, their magnetism, their, there's something about them and you just can't take your eyes off of them. That's it. 
And and Steve Austin walked in the doors in WCW in in, in, ni- in 1991 and had it. Um, uh, Mark Calloway, The Undertaker, had it. Um, Roman Reigns has it. You just know when someone has it. Brock Lesnar, obviously, has it. When these people walk in a room, walk in a crowded room, walk, walk, walk in the middle of a city, and, and everybody goes, whether they're famous or not, that person has it. It, that, that's, that, that's that charisma that just cannot be denied. And, and how I feel about it is that that's, we all have our own purpose in life. Uh, and, and my purpose is to pursue my need to work with someone at that level and, and, and intimately uh, pull out of them a greatness that they couldn't achieve on their own. And how about a lot of actors in any performance, they find something inside of them to help with their performance. You know, you had Howard Stern on the radio, he had a lot of angst. He's trying to find the love of his father. You have actors who have maybe something that happens in their life, uh, some traumatic experience or a breakup or, you know, trying to to get the love of their parents or whatever. Do you use anything from your life and your life experiences or even when you were a kid that kind of comes out in your performances? Oh, I, I, th- I think any, I think anybody of any, any level of accomplishment is, is uh, exhibiting overcompensatory behavior. A- a- absolutely. Whether that's seeking affirmation from a crowd that you didn't get as a child from your parents or, or whether you um, are, are, are seeking a, a, a level of accomplishment because you grew up in poverty, uh, whatever that is, you, uh, anybody who, you know, whether it's Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or, 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 or uh, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, it, 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 do, it doesn't matter um, the, the religion, it doesn't matter the race, it doesn't, it doesn't matter the politics involved. Uh, anybody of great accomplishment is exhibiting overcompensatory behavior. Um, I'm sure I am as well. What that is, I don't know. I have been in need of psychoanalysis since I was a, a little kid, and I just don't have time to go to the appointments. <laughs> and the wrestling business is a good place, though, for that. Oh, it lets it all out. It, it certainly is. Yeah, it, it's, it certainly is a platform for those with uh, this much eccentricity. Yes. <laughs> um, in in all walks of sports entertainment, it's fascinating because you hear about actors who were like supposed to be in a movie, maybe they turned down a role. Um, you hear it vice versa. Was there ever like you in your career, like you think this guy has it, maybe a fellow promoter doesn't think, and maybe that guy doesn't get promoted. Um, has there been like a circumstance that is like a big regret about a guy that you vouch for and somebody else didn't think should get the push? Has there been anything uh, 90% like that? 90% of the ECW locker room were guys that, that were qualified to be major top line, headline, main event acts in this industry. Uh, And most of the other people who were either running the show, financing the show, uh, creatively running the show, didn't have the time, nor the inclination, nor the effort, nor the understanding uh, to capitalize on the greatness that was being offered by people. I mean, if you, if you look back and, and you realize how the highlights of the ECW shows could have simply been hitting the same man's music and letting him drink, you know, a, a half dozen, if not a dozen beers with the audience on the way to the ring and smashing the beer can into his head. How do you, how do you not make a star out of, out of that guy? That, that new Jack, the single most authentic character, perhaps in the history of ECW, who could talk um, a language of the streets back in the 90s that no one in this industry could compare to. There was no place for New Jack anywhere except for ECW. Uh, you look at Rob Van Dam, who has been pushed by every promotion, who has been promoted and marketed by every promotion, who's been a champion in every promotion that he's ever been in outside of ECW, and yet was never given truly the opportunity to be the headline star over a, a, an, an elongated tenure as he was in ECW. And to this day is someone that I believe the entire industry missed on. 
Um, Joey Styles was, was such a fantastic play-by-play -play commentator. Um, and w when he was in WWE, was so constrained by the parameters and the constraints and, and, and the boundaries that were put on him that he couldn't display his greatness. Um, for a long time, and this is something that Paul Levesque has truly addressed as the head of creative in WWE, uh, for a long time, so many in this industry wanted the performers to conform to their vision instead of creative people looking at the performers and saying, I can tap into that. So if you're, if you're a right-hander and I'm envisioning your character as a lefty, then the way the business has been run for a while, I'd be sending you to the gym going, you got to really work on the left hand instead of, I can make this guy the best right-hander in the business because that's, that's, that's what you are, yeah. a right-hander. So we, everybody in this business was, was trying to make characters and personas and people conform to their vision instead of their vision being about what greatness the people themselves offered. That's a great answer. So, so when I... And the other answer sucked? <laughs> but that one was oh, that one was good. First one, okay. The first well, one, I, I, I knew I'd, I knew I'd break the, the the downward slope. Well, there hasn't been any good questions, uh, so well, one of these days I'll give you too, a good question. <laughs> so, so a lot of people creatively, you're you're an incredibly creative person. Uh, you know, Willie Nelson when he makes his best music, he says he's on a little something. Right. Um, you have Eddie Vedder. He comes up with his best music when he's surfing in Hawaii, and right. then he goes and writes his lyrics. Is there a mood you have to be in when these thoughts come to you about angles and things that you're going to do? Like, what what state do you have to be in or mood do you have to be in? Or do you, do you pull over and write something down or text your, a note to yourself or something? How does uh, all the above, uh, it, it, it's, it, the, the inspiration can come from anywhere. Otherwise, you're, 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 you're closed-minded and... and, and, and you know, you have to go surfing to be inspired to write a song or, 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 or you have to roll a joint with Willie Nelson or Snoop in, in, in order to find that, that level of creativity. I think the creativity comes from anywhere. If, if, if you know, if, 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 if you're upset about something, well, okay, what happens if that character gets upset? Well, what if, you know, like, like, like the whole Sandman and, uh, and Raven uh, storyline came about because I had a friend who was one of the toughest people. I have ever met in my entire life. And I don't just mean the fact that, you know, the, the guy could go to the streets with anybody with his hands. I, I mean, mentally and emotionally and spiritually, one of the toughest human beings I've, I've ever met in my life, just, just a, a hard nosed man. Um, and I saw this guy r drop to his knees, weeping openly in front of his friends, of which I was included, because his four-year-old son called the stepfather dad and it, it crumbled I mean absolutely crumbled this hard ass man um, and, and I said man so the hardest character that we had in terms of just you know grittiness you know in, uh, of, of a human being was the Sandman you know the, the beer drinking cane swinging dude at the edge of the bar that you know would would go to fisticuffs with his friends to see who's paying for the next round. That's a hard dude. Yeah. And, and, and the public knew that he had a wife and that he had kids. And I was, well, I wonder what would happen if, uh, since he's been through a public divorce, if his wife got involved with someone else and that someone else was this cult-like cult raven and the kids started following Raven and dressing like Raven and, and identifying with Raven more than his own father. What would that do to a, to a hard-nosed guy like the Sandman? Uh, and, 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 you know, the risk, of course, was the, the audience would look at him and go, oh, what a puss. Oh, come on, you're going to cry over a little kid? Oh, that's not what we like about you. But to show that layer, that depth, that even someone so brutal as the Sandman, so hard-nosed, so one-dimensional, sitting at the edge of the bar, hey, how you doing, and had sl slamming back the drinks, that, 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 that he would have this vulnerability because of his own son. And the audience could relate to it because we all know someone that's like that. We all know someone that's been through that 
torment, that, that heartbreak. Um, and, and so, you know, I saw that happen. I said, wow, I, I could do something with this, with one of her characters, you know. And then, you know, I, I, you're at the China Club and, and, and they're passing around the Stanley Cup and everybody's drinking champagne out of the Stanley Cup with Marc Messier. Okay, well, okay, well, we, how do we transform this into a scene? How do we transform this into a character? So I, I find inspiration everywhere from an Uber driver. And I find inspiration from, from someone that I speak to in, in the lobby of a hotel. I mean, just anybody that I speak to, any, anything that I see is something that if I see it, you can see it. And if you see it and you're from Philly and I see it and I'm from New York and we look at it together and go, wow, did you see that? Yeah, that was very interesting. Well, then that's something that's relatable. And I can take that to an audience. So I find inspiration for create, creative ideas 24-7, 365. Yeah. So now that you're coming to Philly, uh, Saquon Barkley is leaving the Giants in New York uh, and joining the Eagles. Yes. And you've got the Giants owner, John Mara, saying that he's uh, sick by it. Yes. It's... Can this be involved somehow in the uh, I, I don't know WrestleMania? Because, because... Big heel turn? Well, I, I have religiously not followed football because it's fake. The NFL? Certainly. Fake. And, um, yeah. And uh, so I, I've, I've always avoided commenting on, on the NFL because of that fact. How is it fake? How is it not? They line up. They play for a, a Super Bowl every year. Two guys face each other in the ring. Referee says, you ready? You ready? Ding. And they fight for the title. Line, lining up doesn't mean anything. Collisions don't mean anything. But how is it fake? It's, it's, how is it not? It's a competition. It's a legit competition. How do you know it's legit? I mean, that's what I've been led to believe all my life. Ah, well, you see. <laughs> even the most intelligent can be fooled. You're telling me there's a script? Are you telling me that there's not? I wouldn't think there is. Well, and, and that's how good they are at it. <laughs> the NFL is scripted? Well, I mean, we've, we've gone down this rabbit hole way longer than I thought one line would lead us. But <laughs> I don't know if it's scripted or, in, or improv, but I'll stick, with, I'll stick by my guns by saying it's fake. All right. Do you watch any of the other sports? Oh, no. Nothing? Oh, no. I have, well, yes. I watch Matt Remke from the, uh, okay. from the Rangers because right. I like the way he fights. <laughs> you could probably get him on WWE. I, I probably could yeah. if he wanted to pay my commission. <laughs> How about Jason Kelsey in Philly? Philly? How about him? Could he, could he be a WWE wrestler? He could. You think he will be? I don't know. I'd, I'd, I don't know what my cut of that action would be. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if I, if I want to uh, bestow my wisdom upon him for, for free. I mean, I've, I've, as a Hall of Famer now, my, my rate card does go up. <laughs> I mean, we are looking at Central Park right now. Indeed we are. Yeah, yeah. So, so you talk Either about that or it's like one of those chroma keys. Maybe that's fake. You know, yeah. maybe, maybe that's not such. Maybe we're just sitting here in Philly pretending that we're in New York and the backdrop is like what you see on, on the new, well, not on NBC News. No, nope. certainly, Absolutely you know, not. but on some of the other channels, certainly cable. There you go. You know, uh, who, who knows what's really behind us. But we can't fool the Philadelphia fans. <laughs> well, we are often, we are often, no. We are authentic. We are We're, authentic. We are authentic. And that, and that, this and is and that really Park. is Central Park. That really Park. is Central Park. Yes. So, so because you're so great on the mic, can you give me all time, growing up till now, whatever, your top three that you've ever seen on the mic in this business of professional wrestling, not including yourself? None, none, none of them were on camera. None of them were on camera. No, they were. They they were all announcer calls to, to enhance the moment. Wow. And and I, 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 you know, when when someone goes out in front of a crowd, uh, or, or 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 not in front of a crowd, and 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 sells what they're supposed to be selling, hypes what they're supposed to hype. Okay, that that's very singular. I'm, I'm here to hype myself. I'm here to hype my client. I'm here to hype this event. I'm here to hype WrestleMania. I'm here to hype the Hall of Fame. I'm here to hype SmackDown, Monday Night Raw, or whatever the event may be. Uh, but when something happens that's a storyline twist and the announcer gives you a soundbite that lives forever along with that clip 
and it enhances it to such a degree that it's the very definition of the clip. That's going to end up being worth more money than anything that can be said about a singular spotlighted event. So most of the things that I would find to be the greatest moment on a microphone or by people that you're not seeing at the time deliver the line. I think you just got out of giving me your top three on the mic yeah, but in the a, history but, of but wrestling. It was a great line of BS, wasn't <laughs> you it? You got me. Yeah. <laughs> you got me good. Who, do you, who, do you, who would you say are your top three greatest workers that you've ever seen in the ring? Roman Reigns, I would, I, I, if, 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 you, if you watch his body of work, Brock Lesnar, who is probably the most underrated, underappreciated worker I've, I've ever seen. Um, and I'll reserve number three because there is a crop of new talent in WWE that are coming into their own. And whether it's a veteran like Jay Uso, who's just finding himself now in his 30s after, after being part of the greatest tag team in the history of this industry and doesn't understand yet how great he is in the ring. Whether it's Braun Breaker, who has a trajectory that just very few will, will ever enjoy. Rhea Ripley could end up being the greatest or one of the greatest workers in the history of, of this business. That, that, that whole female, look at Jay Cargill. Jay Cargill came in to, to the Royal Rumble and, you know, everybody's like, okay, well, don't expect a lot because, you know, she's so new and tore the house down. Oh, my God, what's her trajectory? What's, what's Bianca Belair's cap? Just, just watching her. Look at Becky Lynch. And, and, and how she continues to find new ways to tell her story. Charlotte Flair? Um, my God, what a talent she is. And, and then you have people like Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams. Um, and you just look at the young roster that is going to be moving up to the top, to, to the main events, and to the, uh, ultimately to the main event of WrestleMania. And, and you realize that Whatever the work rate is today, what's it going to be like in five years? What's that going to be like? What's the style going to be like in five years? What are the demands of the audience? And, 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 to, and, and, and what's the, the level of workmanship that goes, that goes into satisfying that audience going to be like in five years? So to name the third party that goes along with Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar, my answer is... That's to be determined by, by the competition that's happening in front of our very eyes right now of the crop of young talent that's taking over the industry right now at this very moment. You're very good. He pushed that forward. I like that. And didn't answer your question. No, either. I got a top 20. Um, who's going to introduce you to the... WWE Hall of Fame. Uh, I, I, I'm not giving that away yet, uh, <laughs> but uh, to be announced very shortly. And I, I think everyone will sit there and say, that makes all the sense in the world. And it's interesting. Is this going to be six straight WrestleMania main events for you? 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, and two in 2020. Yeah, six straight WrestleMania main events. Um, all, all, all of them with, with the title on the line. Uh, and, 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 and the title was on the line in 2019 at MetLife Stadium as well. Uh, so I, I, I've lost count of, of how many WrestleMania main events I've been in uh, and, and, and how many uh, WrestleManias I've been in where the title was on the line. I just know that nobody is even remotely uh, close to, 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 to those stats. It's an incredible accomplishment. Yeah, and I'm not done yet. There so again, <laughs> it's, it's, it's about, you know, yes, I'll take my flowers, but wow, I mean, I'm, I'm just getting started here. I, there, there's a long way to go, a lot, a lot more to accomplish. So do you think that you still have something to prove to yourself? Or have you proved everything you need to prove? That 13-year-old kid. I was trying to be 
in this spot you're in? I've never tried to prove anything to myself. Uh, it, 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 was, it was never about proving it to me because I, I always knew I was going to make it work because I always knew I had to make it work be, because I always knew that that's the dream. And, 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 and sometimes you have to get out of your own way to, to achieve that dream. So I, it's not, it's, I, I've never looked at it about proving it to myself. It's the desire to, to be that guy. It's the desire to live that life. It's the desire to have stats that are so far ahead of everybody else that you lose the actual numbers. That you say to Tom Brady, is it six? Is it seven? Is it ten? Is it? Yeah, I've, I, you know, like, like I, I've, I've, I've lost fingers and I can put the Super Bowl <laughs> rings on. You know, so, so like I have too many now. I got to start putting Go them to the on feet. my toes. You, 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 exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah, see, yeah. great minds think there alike, and so do ours. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so does but, but you know what I'm saying? It's, yeah. it's, it's like it, it, it doesn't become about the actual number in the stat. It becomes the fact that the stats are so ridiculously ahead of everybody else that you actually lose the, the, the finite number that's attached to the stat. You just sit there and go, hey, look at my, hey, Google me, bitches. You know, <laughs> you know just, uh, you know, look at my stats and come back and talk to me. And that, that, that's the thing. And also, if you sit there and you start reflecting on the stats, you're looking back. And the whole idea is, oh, I want to add to this. I, I, I walk into WrestleMania this year understanding the headliner for the Hall of Fame. We are part of, we, you know, I, I'm a part of the main event Saturday. I'm a part of the main event on Sunday. And the, the moment Sunday ends, my focus goes to WrestleMania 41. There, there's no time to sit back and go, wow, what a weekend this was. The moment it's over, the moment we, cl we, we close the books on 40, I'm looking at 41, 42, 43. Sounds like how Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, and Kobe Bryant, how the great ones all talked. It's literally on to the next one. Do you celebrate that night? I celebrate every, every single solitary yeah. day. It's, the, the celebration is the work. So where do you think that that maniacal obsession to be great comes from? Because not everybody has that. Some people at this point, WWE Hall of Famer, they'd rest on their laurels. I can mail in like my next, you know, promo. Some sort of overcompensatory behavior that I, <laughs> I, have, I haven't come, come to grips with yet because I just haven't bothered to go to psychotherapy. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't try to analyze it. I just know that's me. Yeah. And I know that because I'm wired that way. And, you know, my, uh, you know, my, my parents always told me, you know, do whatever it takes to make you happy that makes me happy. So I go and I pursue it, you know, I, why I do what, 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 le what led me to what, what traumatic experience I've suppressed my whole life to overcompensate for and, 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 and pursue these goals. I have no idea, but I mean, it's got, it's got me happy to this degree at this age. So yeah. I'll just keep on going until one day I just crumble. And go, oh, I can't deal with it anymore. And <laughs> then I know I have stuff to deal with. So is there anybody, because in this world you're in, there are a thousand people fawning, fawning all over you all the time. You're great, you're great. Is there anybody that checks you or you, you ask for somebody's advice and, and you say, you know what, they're right about something? I check myself every day because yeah. I, I, I understand what a schmuck I really am. <laughs> Um, I, I, you know, I, 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 I've, I've been afforded the opportunity to do this because I just don't want to get a real job and never have wanted to get a real job, but I've never had a real job. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, and, 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 I mean, I've, I've been, I mean, I've run my own company. That's not a real job. I've been the executive director of Monday Night Raw. That's not a real job. You know, the chairman of Disney is not a real job. It's, a, it's you're not sitting in a cubicle punching a clock doing nine to five. It's not a real job. I say we work in the toy department. Covering sports. Yeah. We work in the toy department. Yeah. It's fun. Yes. You know, yeah. so uh, that, 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 that's really it. I, I understand, I understand what, what a dumb schmuck I truly am and, and, and just how I, I've been able to hide it so well. You know, it's just that, that, that's it. I, I, no, I, I, I keep myself in check. I, I, and, and, and that's not false humility. I, I truly do understand uh, what I am and, and what I'm not. And I've been able to do this because I really suck at everything else in life. What else would you be, what else would you be doing? I, I don't know because I suck at it all. <laughs>
You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm splay footed, I'm flat footed, so my, my feet go this way. If I ever get pulled over, you know, and, and they want me to walk a straight line, they're going to arrest me even though I've had nothing to drink or, or, or intake. Um, I can't tap dance. I can't juggle. I, I can't play any musical instruments. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really screwed in life if this business goes down. You know, I, 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 I can't, I can barely throw a ball. I can't catch a ball. I can't dunk a basketball. I can't skate with a, with a crap. So, I mean, you know, I mean, what else am I going to do? I mean, I better be doing this because there's nothing else I'm good at. <laughs> well, you're damn good at it. Well, I, be, yeah. I better be, and thank you. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say, Hall of Famer? Uh, I'm not a Hall of Famer yet. Mm-hmm. I, still got, I, still got, I still got to live to get to, uh, to the ceremony. You're tough on yourself. Uh, of course I am. Yeah, All right. You go, you go into the Hall of Fame. You celebrating that night? Popping some champagne? No, having a nice I'm, steak I'm, cel- I'm, ce- I'm celebrating by doing my promo. Okay. I'm celebrating by doing my speech. That, that's the the celebration is 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 the actual act of it all. The celebration is 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 the fact that I get to do it. The celebration is standing there in 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 in, in Philadelphia in that arena it, with you know in front of my peers, my family, uh, the fan base, and getting to deliver that speech, getting to perform. The, the celebration is 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 in the art of it all. That, the fact that I get to do it. You know, I, I heard somebody many, 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 many years ago say, you know, my friends, they all bitch and moan and complain. They get up in the morning and they say, I have to go to work. I get up in the morning and I say, man, I get to go to work. That's me. I, I get to go to work. The celebration, the champagne, the whatever, the party. No, the celebration is 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 in the delivery. Is is in living the dream of standing out there and and giving that speech. That's the celebration, and and I get to share that party with the entire audience, and they're part of the party as well. well we're looking forward to it. As am I. It's a journey, and you never arrive, huh? Never. That's what you're saying. Nah, once you get there, it's t- you know. Time to go out on your igloo and float into oblivion. I don't think you'll ever do that. Yeah, I don't think so no. either. You'll be working until you're what? Until I die. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, they, 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 my, my father was a personal injury attorney north, uh, north of here in the Bronx for his entire life. And, and you ask any of the old school Bronx attorneys in, in the Bronx courthouse, you know, who's your idol? Who's your hero? And they all tell you the same name. Shmuley Zimmerman. Shmuley Zimmerman was a 93-year-old personal injury attorney. And he had a great case. And he tried it at 93 years old. <laughs> and, uh, and he gave his summation to the jury. And he goes, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, your honor, I rest my case. And he put his head down on the table and he, and he died. Wow. Boom. Wow. Lights out. That's the way to go. That's the way to go, <laughs> right? That's dying with your boots on. And he won the case. I and, and he did win the case, there as a go. matter of fact. That's perfect. You know, and I don't know what happened to his commission, but if, if, if anybody who won that case would like to throw it my way... <laughs> I'll accept on behalf of Shmuley Zimmerman. But yeah, so that's, you know, that, that was the way he went. Did his thing, I rest my case, drop dead. Uh, the, and, that's and, a mic drop. That, that, that's, that's, the, a, that, that's the ultimate mic that's drop, right? That's taking it to the extreme. Good way to wrap it up. The future Hall of Famer, Paul thank Heyman. You, thank you, sir. Thank you. It was a pleasure. The greatest. Oh, I'm so flagrant.